being told, I think, that I'm stuck. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. It, the, the puzzle in this situation is, do I stand up or sit down? I think, if you don't mind, I'll stand up. It doesn't mean I'm being formal, but it means I can see you and you can see me. So, so I can yeah. get a sense of reactions as well. It's part of the deal. <laughs> but, uh, so also, it's difficult to know quite how to start off. We said, yes, we're quite happy to spend a few minutes each talking. Um, but it doesn't determine, and I'm sure it won't, any of the sort of directions that you might take. Um, but, and, and I'm long retired, and I don't pretend to date. Make that absolutely clear. Uh, it's things that have been arising lately, well, in a sense, they're all always there, but been coming up a lot lately, has been this typical, the problem of the balance between the specialized and the generalized. So I thought I'd just say a, bit, a little bit about that to start off. Because when I first came into linguistics, um, you know, you were a linguist. There, there was only one division. There were historical linguists who were the inheritors of the old comparative philology, and there were the descriptive linguists. And that was part of my own formation because I started my study of linguistics actually in China. And the first professor that I had at Peking University was a historical linguist, and I valued this experience very much. He taught me Sangha Tibetan linguistics and the principles of comparative historical theory. But I knew by that time I really wanted to work in descriptive linguistics, so he sent me down to a friend of his. Uh, I shouldn't waste time telling you the complicated story about it. I had to get out from what was now then communist China back to what was still nationalist China. <laughs> so my second teacher, and these are both a specialist in description linguistics with the great advantage he knew both the Chinese tradition, he knew very well the whole tradition of linguistics in China, as well as the Western, and he has traveled and studied in, in France. So most of my work then was in that general area of the descriptive. I was very glad to have learned something of the historical way. Well, okay, that was more than half a century ago, and nothing got on. I've tracked some of this in between when all these new fragmentary kinds of linguistics have appeared. Uh, and you're always puzzled, always bothered by this sense, is it possible any longer to be a generalist, or is it even desirable at any point? And I remember now, about 1990, I think, when I went for a year as visiting professor at National University of Singapore, and I called on the vice chancellor when I went in there, and he's asking me what I did, and I said, well, I'm a member of a, a, a rather a outdated species now, I'm very much a generalist, and he beamed me. That is what we need in medicine. He said, we are fragmented. The whole world is just becoming fragmented. Everyone is a specialist in this. We, get, we don't get any generalists who think in theoretical terms. Because there's this session, this kind of perception that if you're trying to cover the whole field, then it must be at a very sort of low level, uh, non-theoretical level somehow. It's like a collection code, you know, collect little bits of this. And of course, it's not like that. So my view has been, it, it, it's just my nature. I just think that way. I tend to go out that way. I always, whatever I'm looking at, I might do a bit of work on some problem, and then I think, yeah, but what do you look like from around the back, you know, from over there? So I feel that at least for some, then please don't take this as an argument against specialization. Of course, it isn't. We have to specialize now in the subject. It's too much knowledge, too, too, many, too much work, too many problems, too many ways in, as it were, to technical uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, I, think, I think that uh, there is uh, not just a value, I think there is a need for some people to have some sort of a, a, an overall view of language. Uh, obviously, your first division is going to include things as well. Am I going to go back in history? Am I going to look at the language in the individual? All those things. But everything you find that all the time, whatever you're working on, there are going to be questions coming up where you have to look outside. And this is, in a sense, what we have been trying to do uh, in, in, in our group, not just myself, but others with a similar sort of background, is to say, no, we need a theory, but it is a general theory. It's not any less theoretical, but it's a different kind of theory, because it is essentially built on a sort of framework which takes in the language as a whole, uh, as, it were, as, as, the, as the foundation for what you do in any particular specialization. So my plea 
to you. I'm mean, not here to give a, give a sermon, but uh, keep in mind uh, that whatever you're doing, look back on the sides and you know, see what this implies and implied for what you are doing by what other people are doing is something else over there or they have been doing. Okay, final postscript and then I'll pass on. Okay. The, the thing that does worry me is that in the, the, the what, last 15 years, uh, in the move into digital <coughs> forms of knowledge, a lot of knowledge has simply been lost. And it bothers me, and I, I will cite phonology because this is why I know about it, uh, that our great and dear friend David Abercrombie, who died some years ago, said some fantastically important work on English phonology, uh, going into questions like syllable duration in English as one of his papers. So the relative duration of syllables and when put in the, in, in the context of the foot. And he did a lot of work on that. And I have been to two conferences in the past two years and had written by people approaching the same sort of area but with digital frames, if were computationally or modern structures of knowledge essentially. But a lot has dropped out along the way. So I, I think we should maintain that, at least keep records, all this stuff is still there, and somehow try and build it into our build it into teaching. And, and this is why incidentally, I mean, I would have, I never knew really whether I should be primarily a grammarian or primarily a biologist, because I love both areas. I ended up mainly doing working grammar, but I sort of go aside into phonology when I write good. And the final thing I'll say is to Paul, you see, they don't teach phonetics these days, do they? So that's that. So lovely to meet you. We'll have some exchange later on. I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, well, if Michael can't be seen sitting down, I'll sit <laughs> <laughs> I'll stand up as well. Uh, well, I, I would also like to... Uh, to um, Draw around the same kind of thing, but um, uh, begin with a more targeted uh, thing, which is to say, uh, when we say we know a language, what do we mean? And uh, to answer this, first of all, I want to look at the concept of language itself. <coughs> Whatever else language may be or may not be, one thing is certain, that it lasts through the ages. And as it lasts through the ages, while lasting, it is changing. And all languages, there is no language known in this world that has not changed. So, in change is inherent in language. In other words, variation of some kind or other is inherent in language. So when we take that view, immediately it becomes a question, when you are linguistics, what are you taking just a particular kind of language and thinking that doing the analysis of this is the aim of linguistics as sociologist, a very brilliant man, and my hero, in fact. But, um, but nonetheless, he said, uh, we don't do parapol, we will do long, because that is the systematic realities of language are what we need to know about. We don't need to know about things like everyday talk that people talk, and because you can't really generalize about talk, can you? Okay? So, that is one way that we began. Um, but I think that there is a danger. Every time you exclude something from the concept of language, not the actual description that you do by using a theory, every time you do that, whatever it is that you suppress raises its head at some point or other and causes a problem. So, it, I've been thinking for quite some time that probably instead of asking what is a theory, we should be asking what is that thing that is 
promising to understand it. Now, when I look at uh, it seems take chronological changes that take one um, uh, what do I call it? <laughs> <laughs> I might have a note of it. Chronolept, chrono, which is, which is, I think, to me, it is a, uh, it is a good chronolept. So it is a, uh, it is a dialect, or uh, that is based in time. Uh, so how do we begin to look at? Uh, how do we establish where it began? It ended well. We can't because it doesn't do it all of a sudden now. It always does it at different points, but there comes it. It is some kind of a climb of variations, so that at a point you see much of that language is hanging together. It is of the same on so many variants of so many things, and then you come to another stage and you find. Oh, at this point, so many things become different that it is a little bit difficult to know what is being talked about. I can't read Chaucer without, most of us can't read Chaucer, an annotation of some kind, the real Chaucer. I can't even read medieval English without, you know. Uh, but Shakespeare I can get with. It is the beginning of modern English. And the problem, when I read the glosses, they seem familiar, but they don't give me an idea of what exactly is going on. So each clause, in some way, is about some kind of going on. And it is a mini context construer. As it is going along, it is contributing to the context. Who is saying? to whom they are saying. So it is along this that we, uh, you know, uh, that the language so that this is not being possible. And this is your, your uh, reason for imagining that, uh, that uh, they, we have arrived at a di different stage. But when we go to the modern language, we see are certain kind of other variations. For example, variation that in system functional linguistics we know as uh, as contextual variation, i.e., uh, variation by use rather than user, by what you are doing with language rather than who is speaking. Right now, all of these variations. Uh, to be studied. If you don't study them, uh, then you don't know why you make chronolects. If you don't make chronolects, then you are you don't really know what a language is, as it, you know. You don't know where it is coming from. Uh, so, a theory, in my view, a good theory is a theory that does not close doors. It does not mean that it is eclectic. It means that it has its process through which you open, you allow entry into things that relate to it. For example, register variation is a variation that we is related to how we live, right? In other words, to the social. Um, then we look at uh, how we make sense of things, and that is your lexical grammar and your phonology. That is the basic formal uh, strength of language. That is the power, is the semiotic power of language. There is nothing that you can really leave out, but the only thing you can do if you want to make a good theory is not to close any doors. 
you cannot, you definitely cannot do all of language at any one point, and it is a sobering thought. What is the language that we analyze most? English. Why do we do it? Because it is not Roman, and it is not Rome's height of fame. Huh? At this moment, English is the most important language, so everybody analyzes English. It doesn't mean other languages are not interesting. It means English is powerful. Okay. But you don't close the door on comparative linguistics for that reason. So, in other words, you do a generalized linguistic theory and specialize within the bounds of that theory. 